Soon it became the desire of many inventors to create a machine which could bridge the gap between the living and the dead. Possibly most famously, Thomas Edison. Edison believed strongly that such a device was possible and held many secret sessions with fellow scientists in an attempt to perfect his machine. In a statement in 1930, he announced that the device he would create would not function by any occult, mystifying, or mysterious or weird means employed by so-called mediums, but by scientific methods. He went on to say, I am engaged in the construction of one such apparatus now, and I hope to be able to finish it before very many months. So here's Edison, just a general photograph of him. Ironically, Edison died before perfecting his instrumental transcommunication device, but his idea became known as the spirit phone, and it became a media sensation. Fast forward to 1949, and an Italian gentleman by the name of Marcello Bacci attends a medium mystic sitting in London, which will change the course of his life. Bacci would go on to be known as the man who offered the world some of the strongest possible evidence of not only the survival of the soul, but of its ability to continue communicating directly with the living. Marcello Bacci of Grosseto, Italy, began to dial in spirit voices through his vacuum tube radio in the 1960s through an experiment known as the Direct Radio Voice Method, DRV. DRV is a method that seeks to obtain anomalous communications directly through the loudspeakers of radios. Bacci's early experiments were carried out using the same methodologies as famous experimenters of the time, such as Frederick Jurgensen and Konstantin Raudov. So he did his initial experiments with uh, Frederick Jurgensen. Frequently, the entities contacted are able to refer to listeners by name, respond to questions directly, and give detailed information to loved ones, which it's claimed only their deceased relatives could have known. Bachi's experiments are carried out in the presence of many people in his home, sometimes up to as many as 70 at a given time. For those who attend his sessions, there is no doubt at all that they are in direct communication with someone in the spirit world, as they claim their voices are instantly recognizable. To hear the spirit voices, Marcello constantly adjusts the knobs as he tunes into the white noise of the short wave band between 7 and 9 megahertz. He tunes into the white noise, which is band-free, by tuning into the knobs to just the right frequency. Spirit voices can be heard coming through the speaker and giving messages. The participants can often immediately detect it is the voice of their loved one. The communication can vary from as short as 10 seconds to a maximum of 4 minutes. The spirit voices are clear and differ from each other acoustically. Then, once communication has ended, the normal static of the radio returns back, like a regular radio. In general, I am not a huge fan of many supposed EVP recordings. I hear often they are incredibly short, just one or two words, and very unclear, leaving them hugely open to interpretation. A phenomenon known as auditory pareidolia. For this reason, I was absolutely fascinated recently to learn more about the measures skeptical researchers and scientists from across the globe have taken in an attempt to debunk Baji's radio communication. And this is where it gets interesting. After exhaustive tests, scientists have been completely convinced that his spirit voices are not a hoax. On the elements which sparks my interest is the use of voice recognition software provided by the FBI and used to conduct voice print analysis, like a fingerprint voice analysis can be used with near certainty to detect the speaker's identity. Voice recordings were obtained from relatives of their loved ones when they were alive and analyzed against the supposed spirit voices coming from the radio. Time and 
spirit voices have been proven to be almost an exact match with one voice, that of Chiara Lancy, matching with an accuracy of 97%. Experts claim that there is no way a voice which matches to an accuracy of 97% can be anyone other than the person in question. This is uh, Chiara. Chiara Lancy. And uh, I think I heard that recording because uh, he kept, he recorded all of his sessions um, during scientific observations. Particular care was taken to see if any external form of transmission device was being used. And scientists then closed Baji's radio in a special cabinet, which prevented any form of external radio wave penetrating. This made no difference to the result of the machine. It still transmitted voices and messages. Professor Mario Salvatore Festa, the professor of physics at Naples University, took things one step further in his attempts to explain how Bocci's radio works. During one particular communication session, when the spirit voices were being received, Professor Festa removed two of the valves from Marcello Bacci's radio, which should have effectively disabled the radio. The spirit voices continued to communicate. He removed the battery from the radio, but the spirit voices continued to communicate through the speakers, and messages could still clearly be heard, much to the amazement of all present. When Festa placed his ear against the speaker, he was in doubt that the voice was coming through the radio. So here's Bachi uh, tuning. I don't I, this wasn't the radio that he normally used, but um, just in his uh, studio. I guess he, this was a basement studio where he used to hold these sessions. So how could this be possible? One theory is that Bachi is acting as a medium, and while not going into trance, Bachi always remains in control his device. It has been suggested that it is he who is acting as the real communication device, transmitting the energy and personalities of those in the spirit world through his contact with the radio. This may well be the case as researchers who have asked Bachi to leave the room and let them attempt contact through the radio have all been unsuccessful. It has since been concluded that in order for spirit communication to take place, Bachi has to be present. Of course, this is something which skeptics argue is suspicious. However, as already mentioned, none have been able to disprove the abilities of the radio. The spirits who come through Bachi's radio have passed on not only personal messages to their families and friends, but some have even given insight into the afterlife, giving hope and comfort to many. And it seems that it is not only the world of the living which gains comfort from these sessions, but also those in spirit. What follows is a transcript from one of Bachi's sessions, in which a spirit gives this message. Certain persons here are not driven by faith, but of curiosity. Many of you apparently come here searching for a sign. Spend your lives wisely and reflect carefully on these extraordinary events. Dear Bachi, this is a wonderful privilege to be here close to you in such a dark, intimate living room. It is beautiful of you to give hospitality to the spirits. To the mothers here who don't correctly understand what I have been saying, life does not finish on earth when you die. Don't forget this. There will be a new world. Put away your uncertainties, your doubts, your anxieties. Dear children, look at me. I am alive here. That was translated from Italian. Bachi keeps tapes of every single session he holds and has a cabinet filled with over 20 years worth of recordings. This statement again comes from a session. Now I can see you. I am in front of those, my very dear friends, that are listening to me. All this arouses in myself a feeling of deep joy. This half an hour passes. 
class together has been a big comfort also for us. All of our friends know your name. Whatever the truth, Marcello Bacci is considered one of the world's foremost experts in ITC and is one of the very few people in the field of paranormal research to have never received any negative feedback or evidence against his claims. So if scientists, researchers, and experts from across the world cannot debunk Bocce's radio, in fact, quite the opposite, they are left astounded by it. Shouldn't we all be taking a moment to consider the possibility that this could be a real phenomenon, whether believer or skeptic? And, um, and then there was a documentary, so you can look it up on YouTube. It, it was about an hour long, but, you know, it was uh, recorded, I guess, um, I, I couldn't tell if it was the late 60s or early 70s, but in any case, he was doing live sessions in those, and you got a feel for uh, how those sessions were going, so you would have these people come in, uh, many of them had lost uh, children, and so, you know, they were particularly distraught, some of these um, children were in their teen years, and, you know, various incidents had occurred, uh, so many of them were mothers, um, you know, who were still in mourning, and it's understandably that kind of a situation leaves a person in a kind of shock, because you feel that, um, the other individual was so young and, you know, never had a chance to kind of fulfill their, uh, what you expected them to fulfill in their life, in their physical life. And so, um, there were a lot of women there, men and women, but, you know, um, that had that situation. So, uh, I didn't realize that was his home. I thought it was like a, a studio, but this must have been in the basement, and, um, you know, it fit quite a few people, so they were all sitting in the background. He was up at the front with, um, his radio, so let's, I mean, that was one picture. He had a couple of, uh, radios in the front. Um, let's see. Sorry for scrolling. Um, I guess it was right at the top. Okay, so anyway, so he would be up at the front of his studio uh, with this radio. This was the radio that he used. And all he was doing was sitting there and fiddling with these dials. So he was constantly trying to fine tune, which is within that range, that short wave range. And, um, you know, a voice would come through and say, uh, uh, Dear Bachi, or something like that, it would start like, like, uh, kind of a formal thing every time, and that was supposedly a spirit, I guess you can call it a spirit guide, but they were very clear that they were a, um, you know, almost like a, an announcer or something like that, like that spirit was not part of this regular transmission, but was the go-between kind of, uh, curtailing whatever was going on in the realm that they were in, because there were bunches of, uh, you know, according to, according to the spirit, there were a lot of people, um, in, in spirit form that had come to communicate with these various, uh, family members that were in Bachi Studio. So, now the question is, um, apparently, I guess these people had the intention of going to Bachi's. I don't know that they did anything other than think about it or make an appointment or whatever. And that was enough for the spirit on the other side, um, to know to come to this particular zone at this particular time when this session was going to be held. And there is some, apparently some kind of a mediator on the other side who would, uh, you know, pause bef before each different one would uh, come through. So it was never a haphazard kind. It was always very organized. So there's that. That was kind of interesting because 
because there was no like bunching up of multitudes of it was always one at a time you know so then um so some sort of like a formal announcement was made and then one uh, spirit would come through and, and would say something like um uh ma, mama something whatever uh or it would give their own name i am so and so and uh I, I see my mother there or I see whomever there and then that person in the audience they wouldn't stand up or anything but they would just kind of obviously become um, alerted they were allowed to come forward and sit with Bachi and then ask questions if they needed to but a lot of times the spirits had particular messages but then um, they could answer questions in real time so the mothers wanted to you know obviously they wanted to know if they were okay if they were fine and the, all of the spirits would always um say that yes they're in a, they, you know they would say things like they're in a realm of light and um and that it's not the same as the real world but it is a situation where they have no need for anything and so therefore it's a different kind of existence but they're still very close to him whomever it is um one particular spirit who was a lawyer um and was a little bit educated about radio waves and this sort of thing so this was during his life but now he had passed on um was able to explain the zone that they were in they said that above the earth there are different spheres like the ionosphere and the this sphere and the that sphere and they had to come into this um, particular zone the ionosphere in order to have this communication through the radio wave um and uh they would gather here based on who was going to be coming to the session and this is how it was done and and like i said it was very organized because none of these people were you know jumping at the mic and there was no confusion it was it was one after the other um it's it's very bizarre like it's hard to say what is real and what is not there yet one other factor that i thought was kind of interesting in the documentary um i forgot what they called it it was i guess an italian word they had a thing of a, a term that means to like appear a thing that appears maybe as apparatus or not apparatus but what whatever the word was um it it just meant that these guys could make any sort of little object and make it appear within that space and so um you know like if they wanted to produce a flower a flower would literally fall from the ceiling or just you know show up on somebody's lap or whatever because it's it's that was also a very strange thing because bachi's in the front okay so he's not doing anything yes there are other people that obviously know him um like maybe one or two attendants but they are also in the front so they're not doing anything and these people are fixated on what's being said through the speakers of this machine right so they're looking forward but nobody is walking through the um aisles or anything like that it's not like aisles it's just a bunch of chairs you know set up uh you know just all straight in a line kind of a thing i like maybe i guess seven rows of 10 or something like that you know nobody is walking through there and all of those people came you know took their coats off or whatever they were doing and they just sat down and are waiting at the end of the session which is maybe like a two hour session or something like that they look down and different objects are are on their knees or on the chair next to them or on the floor which were not there according to them and i don't think they were lying they were genuinely surprised and they were very specific to that particular spirit or person that uh you know they had come to communicate with even if they did not get a correct a direct communication from that individual a lot of them would get these sorts of presents um the one that was most convincing was this one where the woman um found this uh piece of it looked like it looked like uh rose quartz but is she uh, well, I wasn't sure I think she said it was jade the thing is she then pulled out her necklace and said look this is an exact match to my necklace and this is like as if it's another half of 
it like it was the same piece. Now, how in the heck? Could, I mean, I understand there are scam artists and all kinds of possibilities here, but you know, for something so specific and sh you know, uh, to be designed and placed, and I mean, I don't know, maybe she had come on several occasions and somebody had seen it and, and then but then why why would they do this why would they hurt people like that if, if that were the case the other thing is he never took any money it's not like he was doing a business um you know where he had to keep convincing these people so he's doing this thing for free um and this is just so bizarre i just don't even know what to think about it because when you see like these little objects appearing i mean and some are very intricate objects like little pocket knives and then they would say yeah my son used to collect pocket knives and so and that's the object that would show up on their lap or something and they didn't have that with them so i just i you know when you see stuff like that it's just I, a person doesn't know what to think if, are these things possible yeah apparently they might be possible but uh, it's also just shocking too. And then on the other hand, as a skeptic, I mean, I know that scams and those kinds of things can be done as well. Many of those people in the interview said that nobody knew them over there. They had not asked uh, or answered any questions. I mean, if you go to some of these psychics, like even the ones that appear on television, um, people, the producers, a lot of times have done a lot of background information uh, on certain audience members. You find that out later that, you know, a, sort of the, a lot of these people had files worth of information that had been fed to the so-called psychic. And so then you can kind of see there's a bit of a scam and there's also a methodology of sort of um, saying, uh, asking certain questions and then picking up on little trigger uh, reactions in people and sort of, you know, being able to figure out what to say. It's a it's th there are people who are professional scam artists who you know pose as mediums and channelers and that kind of thing that is 100 percent true the difference with Pachi is he was not talking he was not in any kind of trance he wasn't doing anything other than fiddling around with the um these two knobs he w it was just uh it it's just very strange and then the bizarre thing of of the professor coming and taking out all of the um equipment the the tubes and the battery like there was no reason for that radio to be working but yet it was working even without that stuff in it and uh my explanation for that possibly i mean the human body is electric and by bachi keeping his fingers on the knobs um he could have been the transmitter i know they're referring to him as like that he could have been the medium but really he could have been the electrical circuit kind of completing the circuit so that the radio could work um then nobody ever tested bachi for that like there's certain people that if you put one of those radio um, meters uh, next to them. They're just giving off a certain amount of uh, electrical charge, or you can test the magnetic field around them just a little bit. Some people are a little bit more intense. I have a tendency to do that uh, sometimes where I'm just like, you know, shutting the lights and then the lights blow up or, you know, things like that have happened. Um, and so some people have a little stronger electrical energy field every now and then, um, whether it's emotions or, or whatever the case may be. So I do think that it's possible that he was the circuit that might have been completing um, that radio transmission. Now, is there a possibility that he's some kind of a ventriloquist? I don't think so. I think that his mouth is totally closed. I mean, you know, I was looking at that aspect too. Like, is there any kind of movement? There was nothing. And, um, you know, could it be somebody from another room, you know, just talking through the speaker somehow, like just having a, a certain connection in another part of the room and talking? The thing is, they would need to know not only would they need to know such specific information, I mean, the information part, I would say, is not even a big deal. You can find information if you're really after it. 
sort of a thing. What is impressive is when they do the voice accuracy tests and they found that not only were all of these voices different, they were they were directly recognizable to the people who know those individuals in life, but then when they tested those voices against previous recordings of those people, they were showing up as voice matches. Um, and, and all of the voices that I heard on the video were different voices, so now you would have to have somebody so talented, you know, in the background, um, sitting there and, and knowing how to make all of these different voices and, and making a match would be just impossible. The other weird thing is that one of the scientists who were uh, looking at the voice system said these voices, the way that they are coming through there is apparently, you know, when we speak, our larynx um, moves, it, it moves in a certain pattern and it can be picked up by, uh, you know, these meters, different applications on these um, voice recognition systems. And he's, the scientist said that the weird thing is that the voices coming through the radio are not matching human voice patterns. The sound that's coming through is matching the person's sound, but there's like a, some sort of a cadence variation thing uh, that was not matching anything human, which is very weird. He said that the opening and closing of the aperture that's coming through on the computer um, it, that's coming through the graphics was not matching human voices, but yet they were recognizable in terms of their sound. Um, so that's also very strange. How, how would that be possible? Like, you know, there's too many, there are too many technical aspects to this that I don't see how they would have scammed it. These guys were not that sophisticated, really, um, to be able to do this kind of a thing. I mean, yes, there's a possibility, but I just, I don't know. It was, it was, it's pretty intricate what, uh, the little weird things. The other thing that they noticed was there was no pausing, normal pausing within human speech is usually because you got to take a breath, you know, you have to take a breath, you're, um, thinking or whatever the case. He said there is no pausing in any of these, uh, transmissions because they're not in bodies. They don't have to take a breath. And these are like little details that a person might not notice, but these technicians who had studied human speech were noticing. Um, and that makes it even more authentic seeming, you know, because yeah, that's true. They wouldn't need to take a breath. They would just be speaking stream of consciousness. And, um, you know, I don't know, all of these little things were just it was just, I have to say, it was a pretty convincing video. The people who were making it were making it um, as skeptics, but then they didn't know what to make of it in the end because it seemed to be true. The other thing is, in a way, I mean, look, he was doing a, a good thing no matter whether it was a scam or not, I guess, because those parents who had that loss in their life, um, all of them, said that they found a like new life afterwards because it gave them a sense of um you know just peace that their children were fine that their loved ones were fine and were close to them but just outside of range of our view range and then they went to another scientist who said yeah the human beings are only able to see five percent of the matter that is actually existing even within the same space so 95 percent of the um matter that's out there right in the same space you can't see it uh so that makes it possible that you know you can have something that's just out of our physical sight range existing we just can't see that sort of thing um you know so they they, they brought in as many scientific proofs as possible and uh it just was so it was just it was very nice i you know i usually <laughs> i don't sit for a one hour um videos or documentaries or whatever but i did find this kind of I just found this very interesting, and I wish I could get a hold of, like, an old radio like this. I don't know where I could find something like that. Um, it would be kind of scary, obviously, if voices start coming through, because you don't know who's coming through. The one thing that I, I before I started watching, was um, how come all of these people are Italian? Like, you know, granted, everybody in the audience was, in it, was Italian, but never. 
ever um, did a random American or, you know, what, uh, somebody from another country just show up at these meetings, at these spirit sort of exchanges was like a very specific group matching the group that had come for these sessions. And uh, at, at one session, though, a, a person did come in who was a Swede and who just had something to say in general. Um, so then, you know, that that was also kind of answered my question in terms of like, okay, so some oddballs <laughs> did show up, but it was it was strangely organized too by the spirit conductor, whomever it was on the other side, in terms of getting uh, everybody that was like the right person uh, to be communicating, and it, there was a apparently some level of organization. Oh, the other thing they had was at the end of the sessions, one person from the audience asked, could we have a choir, uh, you know, make a, a singing sound? Like, uh, you know, this was a random question for uh, this kind of a phenomenon. Just, you know, how would somebody in the back, if, if there was somebody just kind of answering live questions, um, how would they then be able to produce a choir? Because a choir was, you know, was introduced suddenly, and they started singing in unison. Um, it's just I I don't even know what to say. Yeah, I know they can do all kinds of things, and maybe the person asking the question really was a plant or whatever. But he said he wasn't. He he said it was a random question. And he just you know asked this, and uh, that was delivered. Um, so I, you know, I don't know. I know that they can do these sorts of things with a very organized sort of system, but there was nothing to gain by doing this. Not like he was a, on television and had, you know, a studio and producers and all these people out there. He had nobody. He was just sitting in his house with every, I didn't even realize that was his house, but just sitting in his house doing these sessions, I guess, once a week for anybody who would show up. He didn't have a list. You know, he wasn't, or he was personally not organized in any way, in the same way that these other, this, the group on the other side was. And he, um, he was doing this for free. He wasn't taking any payments. So, you know, is he just trying to do a good deed to make these people feel better? But he's not interacting or, or pushing, and he's not pushing his, like, spirituality or, or anything on them either. He doesn't really talk to them or have, because he's taking this, like, a scientific thing. He doesn't consider himself a medium or any of those. He's not considering himself a channeler or something of that nature. And he did this for 20 years you know, 20 years for free, um, and not becoming, like, particularly famous, or, you, you know what I mean, just maybe within that town, people knew about him, but it wasn't, like, a world-famous sort of phenomenon. Uh, he did record all of the sessions so that people had tapes of them, and, um, you know, you could play back these tapes, and they were all very consistent with their message in terms of um, the, the realm that they were in was different from the earth, but it basically was everything that they could have possibly imagined. It was a realm that was, um, primarily made of light, and, uh, they could produce physical objects at will if they needed to, but basically they were existing in this uh, realm of light. They were light, and it, it was just this zone of uh, high emotions, like everybody was, there was uh, no need, so there was no negativity. It was um, a situation where they were all at peace, and they um, were very happy. People did ask them, have you met God? Have you, you know, there were people did have these questions, and they were consistently saying no, the same sort of uh, silence, you know, is... Uh, of not having a response, like let's say if a person is praying or something in this life, uh, they don't get a direct, you know, voice response. They said it's the exact same over there. It's not like you meet somebody and there is some kind of communication. So uh, they might have said it a little bit more eloquently than I, I just did, but he said it was the same kind of silence, um, you know, on earth as it is in that realm. But obviously, he was not claiming that there wasn't this figure. It was 
it's just that it was not um, a place where you're suddenly, you know, I guess how people think of it as, um, as a place where you're in direct communion or something. It was just, it was a, just a different realm where these spirit forms or light forms could exist. And, um, you, and it was an experience that they were all very happy with and calm with. Not any of them were saying that they regretted their experience or wanted to come back or anything. There was never any situation like that. So, um, I don't know. I found it, I found it kind of consistent in terms of its message. I was actually happy that it was not catering to a particular religious point of view because then that becomes a little questionable. There was nothing like that. Um, it was just that this was a realm close, very, you know, right in the same vicinity, but just you can't see it because um, the frequency was different. We couldn't, uh, that's all the, the change was. So, you know, they would even tell the tell their parents things like, um, we remember that day you felt a tap on your shoulder and that was me, that kind of a thing. And, and then, you know, and that's, how would anybody know that? Like, how would Bachi know that that had happened last Thursday or something like that? I mean, there were just little things that were very convincing to the people sitting there. And it would be kind of virtually impossible for Bachi to know this stuff or to have anyone in it on his team know this kind of information. Um, it didn't seem like he was in, you know, direct communication with these people. One woman said, nobody knew me here. I didn't talk to anybody. I just showed up and her son, uh, came through, you know, the speaker that night. And she said, there's nothing else, you know, that can convince me more than this. And he had specific information and I think he might have given her a little gift to do. Um, something very specific to her, so uh, it, it was just, it was very interesting. I think one um, spirit had left, like, seashells or something, and because the way that they had died was in the ocean, and so they gave them a starfish, and, like, suddenly those objects appeared, shellfish, shells, and a starfish appeared uh, either on their chair or somewhere in their vicinity after the session was over. I, you know, that's such odd, those are odd things. It's not something that would be lying around a starfish. And again, how would anybody know about that? They had not told them. Um, but it's like such a specific object. So, uh, you know, it, there was a lot of convincing stuff in there. Uh, hopefully these guys were not scamming. And I think the other thing that was interesting was even Alexander Graham, or was it Edison? Um, his, yeah, Thomas Edison's interest in this uh, phenomenon, he had gone to a couple of these so-called medium-type meetings and found out that the, you know, machines that they were using at the time were able to um, pick up some kind of a signal which seemed to pick up voices from beyond, so to speak. So, you know, he was a scientist himself, and he was very specific in terms of saying that, look, we're not going to do any kind of a cult, uh, this or that. There, There is this machine, and he had seen it, he had worked with it, and uh, he was now going to invent something that could pick it up a little bit more clearly. Um, but, uh, you know, he didn't get to finish that, unfortunately, but it was basically he wanted to make a spirit phone that you could literally pick, pick it up and uh, maybe adjust the dials themselves. It probably would have been a small kind of radio to look like a phone, but then you could directly talk to these people that had passed on because they would have, like, you know, a direct way of communicating. That's what he wanted. Now, who knows if that would have thrown too many... Um, people off and uh, if he was just simply not allowed to make that machine um, because he passed kind of suddenly and he was gung-ho on making that very specific machine maybe that that um, was an issue that might have affected too many religious groups or I don't really know but uh, it's it's still very interesting 
that, you know, a, a straightforward scientist totally believed in this because he had seen evidence of it. And Bachi was a scientist and he was do doing this from a scientific perspective and had brought in all scientists to test it. And all of these scientists were getting convinced that this was an actual phenomenon that they couldn't explain directly, but it was happening. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's something to look into. It's, I guess, a little scary, but then uh, very interesting, too. I mean, I've seen all the ghost shows and, and everything where they have those little recorders and they're picking out. I, I, I'm not, I'm still kind of suspicious of anything that's like on TV like that because I just feel there's a, possibly a little bit of scam going on in those. But it was hard to believe that about this particular case, uh, just viewing the people that were involved and the way that they were doing it. It just didn't seem likely. But anyway, um, you know, I'm open to the possibility of either. I just found this to be a particularly interesting case. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. And um, this was the story of Marcella Bacci, the spirit radio uh, uh, 